I have this beautiful tree in my backyard. It's a blood orange tree, and it produces really good oranges. And usually every year, it produces an enormous amount of oranges to where, I mean, it's, it's like so many, we have to like give, give them away, or they're like falling on the ground, and we're like, oh, whatever. You know, it doesn't matter if we lose 20, we still got like 250 left, right? So it usually produces an enormous amount, but for whatever reason this year, it decided to produce nothing. So I'm very upset because that is like our one defense, vitamin C wise, against illness for the entirety of, of winter. So now I don't know what I'm gonna do, but we're gonna have to find another way to acquire free vitamin C. <laughs> Uh, if you guys know any dealers, uh, let me know. But um, we, don't, we don't know how to acquire free vitamin C like we used to. So it's really frustrating when you have a tree that you're expecting to produce fruit and it is not producing. Um, so for, for the spiritual life that God will talk about throughout Scripture, he talks about vegetation and fruit. And it seems to be one of his favorite metaphors for describing vitality and growth and results. So let's actually turn to John 15, and we're going to talk about one of Jesus' most well-known metaphors for himself. And if you do need a Bible, thank you, Brandon. Um, does anyone need uh, to have a Bible today? Okay, yeah. And feel free to uh, take it with you today. It's our, it's our gift to you. So we're going to turn to John chapter 15, and we are going to go through this. All right. John chapter 15 says, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Okay, so what is this comparison Jesus is making with like this vine and a, and a farmer and you know, fruit, like what, you know, what's going on here? And, and, and we're branches. So, so Jesus is obviously not saying like a literal plant, but for whatever reason, God really loves to use vegetation as his prophetic metaphor. So Jesus says he is the true vine. So in other words, there are other vines out there that are false. All of them are false. And he's saying, I'm the only true vine. So there's one true vine and I am that vine. And God the Father is the farmer, and he cuts off every branch in me that doesn't bear fruit. So in other words, Jesus as the vine is going to have branches that are just not fruit producing, and there are others that are fruit producing. Now, what's a little tricky about the rendering and translation of these words is maybe a, maybe a better translation could be something like, I am the vineyard, and every vine in me. It's just because of the plant itself, so it's a little, you know, the rendering of it is a little confusing, but we don't need to split hairs. The, the idea is this, is that Jesus is basically like the vine itself, and there are parts of him or that are connected to him uh, that are either not producing fruit or are producing fruit, right? So you might be wondering, like, what, what is this, and like, where does this come from? Let's actually turn back to Isaiah. So the book of Isaiah, you go back the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 5. And there are actually many passages in the Old Testament that refer to Israel as a vine. We're not going to get to all of them, but I will point out to you a, a major one, which is Isaiah chapter 5, verse 1. So Isaiah chapter 5, verse 1 through 7. I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. My loved one has a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleared it of stones and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut out a wine press as well. Then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. Now you dwellers in Jerusalem and people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done for my vineyard than I have done for it? When I looked for good grapes, 
Why did it yield only bad? Now I will tell you what I am going to do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge and it will be destroyed. I will break down its wall and it will be trampled. I will make it a wasteland, neither pruned nor cultivated, and briars and thorns will grow there. I will command the clouds not to rain on it. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the nation of Israel. So throughout the Old Testament, God is going to compare his chosen people, the land of Israel, the people of Israel, as a vineyard. So this is God's prized plant. This is his favorite plant out of all the plants that he's made. And you can think of the other nations as being the other plants. But this is his favorite plant. This is God's chosen people. And what Isaiah is prophesying is that God was expecting good fruit from Israel because God revealed himself. It was the only nation that he shared like the Ten Commandments with. And, you know, he personally revealed his glory and power in so many specific ways. And yet his people rejected him and it said they yielded only bad fruit. So God, that was not his intention, is to have a nation that yielded only bad fruit. God's intention was that his nation would yield fruit. That's why you have a vineyard, is to get the grapes from the vines, right? So he was, only, you know, he was, he was looking for good grapes. It only yielded bad ones. And then it says God's going to judge it. And actually what does happen is God does judge it. And, and um, you know, Assyria comes in on the, for the northern kingdom. Babylon for the southern kingdom later, and basically the entire nation will have to be evacuated, and they'll be cast off into exile, and eventually, yes, uh, it will be deserted, basically, and there will be briars and thorns covering the land, and then later, Nehemiah is going to come back and rebuild the wall, but the wall's broken, right? So in other words, God's heart, always for his people, was that they would be productive, Um, and not productive in the sense that they were just doing so many good things to appease God or to gain favor with God, but they were so connected with God and so in love with God that the natural results of them being connected as just you would a, a part of a plant to the stem would be to produce fruit. That would be the natural result of being connected in a right, right relationship with God. So whenever you look at fruit, whether in the Old Testament or, in, or the New Testament, God is talking about spiritual results of being in a right relationship with him and usually that entails is that as people are holy god's god is holy which means set apart and therefore god's people are also to be holy and set apart that's god's plan so whenever god initiated the the people of israel whenever he started this nation through abraham his intention was that they would be a separate and holy people and that they because of what god was doing in that nation would testify to all the other vines out there hey you know, we're the true vine because we're in God and they're supposed to bless the nations. But unfortunately, Israel was yielding bad fruit. So spiritual fruit in- implies holy living, living according to God's will. It implies a deep faith, a deep trust alone in Christ. It involves love. Love is a mark of the Holy Spirit. And it's love that it's not transactional, like you do this for me, I'll do this for you. It's a love that is unconditional. So that is the love of the Holy Spirit, even to love our enemies. It's also repentance. The fruit of repentance is turning away from worldly living and to think rightly, to think in a godly way, to to love God with our minds. And also with good actions that are not manipulative or used to be coercive to get something from other people, but it's good deeds just because we love people. And that love is a foreign love because it came from Christ. So that is God's intention But unfortunately, God is going to say that he's going to cut off every branch in him that is not bearing fruit. So in order to understand this parable, we have to understand that he is just talking about Israel primarily for the context of this passage. Um, He is primarily talking about, as it stands, as he is telling this parable, that, that Jesus is the vine that was prophesied about. And there are going to be Jews who reject Jesus, and there are Jews that accept Jesus. And the ones that reject him, that say, you are not the Messiah, well, Jesus is going to cut off. So here's my bumper from this week. (laughs) So what happened was, I was driving for Uber, and I had four Canadians in my car. And as I was driving on a rainy Wednesday down Jamboree and almost Bison Street, or whatever street that is, I... um, came to a stop because the other cars were stopped in front of us in the left lane and it was rainy and all of a sudden we got 
rocked. We got hit from behind. And I don't know if it was because of the rain. I don't know if it's because the person's car just wasn't working or you know, maybe they weren't paying attention. I don't know what the deal was, right? So anyway, um, my car uh, was damaged. And this was flopping. It was somewhat detached. But it wasn't very functional as a bumper anymore. You can see it's, it's got some holes, but it was, it was kind of like just hanging kind of like that, right? Um, and so it, it didn't do me much good. So I didn't want to continue driving with this thing, you know, dangling. So I broke it off. <laughs> and uh, now it's uh, not dragging on the road and potentially being a hazard. So in other words, this thing is rendered useless, right? So I broke it off. Uh, in the same way, there are branches that Jesus is saying that are connected to him that are useless because, am I getting black on my face? Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I was like looking at my hand and I was, oh, I am. Anyway, it's okay. Uh, Jesus be glorified with a black smudged face. <laughs> Make eye black out of it. <laughs> okay, so anyway, I don't need that anymore. Oh, thank you. It's a little damp. Well, that's too kind. Thank you. Yeah, hold on. Okay. Thank you. I had a feeling, because I, I was get, starting to get some perplexing looks on, on your face, and you're like, oh, something's wrong. Anyway, so, 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 so I had to cut off the bumper that was not working, right? In the same way, Jesus is saying there are going to be people who are going to identify with God, but they are unproductive. And so I need to cut them off in order to st stop like sending resources to these other people branches that are not actually doing anything for me, and it's sucking out the vitality that could otherwise be used for other more productive branches, right? So that's why I used to cut them off. So obviously these are not literal branches. These are people. So these are people who are somehow connected with Israel because they are genetically, ethnically, uh, you know, Israelites, but they are not actually really connected to God through Christ specifically, and so they're going to be cut off. Now, after that, it says that he's going to prune the fruitful branches, right? He's going to prune them. Now, he's not referring to, like, prunes that you, 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 that you eat. Pruning just means to clean. You're going to trim them. Uh, you're going to actually, when you, when you clean branches, you actually make them even more productive. Uh, the only bad thing is that it involves cutting. And so you know in the Christian life that it's not particularly enjoyable sometimes to be sanctified. It's uh, sometimes kind of painful and, and uh, uncomfortable. So in the same way, Jesus is saying there are only two options. One, you're going to be cut off. You're, you're, you know, like there's going to be judgment. Or you're going to experience some kind of cutting, but it's going to be for your good. It's going to hurt, but it'll be for your good, and it'll actually make you more productive, right? So Jesus is encouraging, saying, hey, yeah, there's a cutting involved, but there's actually a, a, a double meaning to the word pruning, because it also means to clean. Okay, so 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 he's saying pruning, like he's literally cutting a plant, but also the word also means to clean or to sanctify. So, so Jesus is saying, hey, like my father is actually going to sanctify and make more productive the branches that are actually really attached to me, right? So every fruitful branch he prunes, and he does reassure them. He's like, hey, chill out. Like before you're worried about whether you're going to be cut off or not, like you're already clean. You're already clean because I already spoke my word to you. And when I spoke my words to you about who I am, you received it and you said, praise Jesus. Okay, so you're in me. Don't worry about it. But it's kind of weird because he encourages them to remain in him. He's like, hey, you're already clean, but hey, stay with me. And they're like, I wonder what they're thinking, because I wonder if they're like, why is he telling us to stay with him? Because he said we're already clean. Like, is my salvation at stake? Like, am I going to lose my salvation potentially? I think some people misjudge this passage, and they do try to make it about, like, losing one's salvation. Um, my perspective when I read scripture is I see a certainty when it comes to being sealed with the Holy Spirit, that we're guaranteed, um, like, the Holy Spirit is our deposit until salvation. I, I, I do biblically believe there's a perseverance of those who have really trusted in Jesus. And so with that, I don't think that's what he's talking about, is that somehow there's a fear of, you know, people being cut off who have already trusted in Jesus, um, because, yeah, you can't, how can you, how can you take away a gift that's already been given? So I think that's, that's the, that, the, the challenge with that idea. But he does remind them, hey, like, you're already clean because of the words that I've spoken to you, so remain in me. And they're already, they're already clean because 
They have internalized, they believe the words he said, but also remember Jesus says that he is the word. So he's the living word of God, which means that if Jesus residing in us by his Holy Spirit remains in us, well then, good, we're connected to the vine because Christ is in us, we're in Christ, we're connected in this, this vine thing that, that is uh, united, right? So with that, he says, you know, remain in me. So what, what is this saying? I think what he's encouraging them is, is to abide in them in the sense that we are trusting in Jesus that is compatible with our salvation. So what I mean by that is it is contradictory to um, be actually saved, but then to live as if you are not, if that makes sense. Um, so I'll give you an example. So I saw an interview this week, which... I was kind of blown away by it because I, I used to listen to Lecrae a lot. He's a Christian rapper. And yeah, he had such powerful songs. I remember like some of them had big impacts on me. But then I kind of noticed a trend over the years where it became less about the Bible and about Jesus and is kind of doing something different. I didn't really know what was going on. But I saw this interview and he was talking about what happened during that time. And he was just saying, yeah, basically I fell away from Jesus. You know, I, I was, was uh, you know, doing drugs. I was, uh, you know, at these parties and, and drinking and, and things like that, getting drunk. And I, I don't know. It, it sounded like he was overindulging. That's what his point was. But I think that is the idea of not remaining in Jesus. Now, positionally, like, I think Lecrae has genuinely trusted in Jesus and turned from his sin. But, but there's a there's a hypocrisy that happens when, when one is actually saved, but they're living like they're not, right? So I think that's what Jesus' exhortation is, is, is to remain in him because of the words he's spoken. And therefore, if we're, we're internalizing what the Bible says, what, what God has said, then we will live as God wants us to live. And so with that, the branch cannot bear fruit by itself. So, you know, you've obviously, you know, broken off a stick or you've held a, a stick and used it as a sword. I used to do that and actually with our neighbor's tree they had this big tree until my dad suggested that they uh, remove it and I think you helped out them yeah you paid for it actually yeah <laughs> Pay, paid for the neighbor to remove their own tree but yeah it was it was a it was a giant tree and it was getting leaves everywhere but I yeah I would take a stick and I would I would whack all the other leaves everywhere and you know it was fun it was it was fun until it, it, it went away and then um, the point being though that like you, you don't expect a dead stick to start producing fruit it's like, oh, yeah, I'm going to take this stick and put it in water, and, you know, it's just going to, you know, populate some apples, right? It, it doesn't work like that. Like, when it's detached, it's dead, it's, it's dead, right? So in the same way, Jesus is saying, you, you cannot bear fruit unless you're in me. Now, a lot of people, they'll say, well, I'm going to be spiritual. I'm going to do my own thing. I'm going to be this holy, good, righteous, amazing person, but on my own. I don't need Jesus. I don't need to be in the vine. I don't need to be associated with him. I'm going to do my own thing. I'm going to be my best version. Sorry, I'm choking on my spit. Um, I'm going to be the best version of myself through self-actualization and my own moral effort. I'm going to just will myself into holy living. And what happens is it doesn't work. Two, you get disappointed. Three, you become arrogant, even if it works. And four, you become so dejected and, and demoralized when you realize that you do not have the power to be able to do what only Jesus can do. So with that, you know, this whole idea of deconstructing our faith, which is, is kind of a modern way of saying I'm walking away from Jesus. And, and a lot of people are doing that. I, I think it's, it's unfortunate because I think some of their reasons for why they might want to leave Jesus, some of that comes from church hurt, which I do think there are legitimate concerns with some of American churches today, which, which I, I totally can understand. But that doesn't mean we throw away Jesus you know, when, when we have some bad church experiences, that doesn't mean we, doesn't mean we leave uh, Christian fellowship when that happens. Um, you know, we're, we're still supposed to follow Jesus and be with other Christians, right? But, but it's, uh, we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, right? So with that, Jesus, I think, just wants to assure them, hey, like, you're with me, you're clean, but by the way, uh, you, yeah, you can't bear fruit on your own. You have to remain in the vine. So I am the vine, you are the branches. All right. So let's move on to verse 5. John fifteen five says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. 
If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is, my fa- this is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. All right. So he's saying, hey, disciples, I'm the vine, you're the branches, remain in me, and you'll continue to bear fruit. Okay? Just a reminder, yeah, you can't do anything apart from me. So I think it's important to recognize that we literally cannot do anything of spiritual benefit without Jesus. And also, it gives us no reason to boast if God does anything through us, because that means it has everything to do with the, the stem itself and the vine and, and us receiving nutrients that would enable us to produce fruit. Because if it wasn't that case, then, then the, the branch in and of itself, we know, doesn't produce fruit, right? Uh, like a dead stick doesn't produce fruit. So in the same way, there, there's a deep humility that comes with abiding in Jesus and reflecting on the fact that he is the one who produces spiritual fruit in us only because we're attached to him, right? So I'll give you an example of how this can work. So, so I, one of my side hustle jobs is working for this organization, and, and I get sent to speak at schools, and I talk about internet safety for students, and I give parent seminars. And what's funny about that is that the script and the PowerPoint, like everything is already pre-done for me. There's like a script. I just, I just basically give the information as if my boss would do it, but he can't be in multiple places, so I'm like his carbon copy for these other locations. Now, it's a little weird when people say, oh my gosh, like that was so great. Thank you so much, and that was so amazing. But it would be weird for me to take credit for it and be like, oh, yeah, I know. It was so amazing, right? But it's like, I didn't create the content. I didn't create the slides. I, I literally just am telling them what my boss told me to say, right? So that'd be, uh, and, and, and you know, when they're, when they're clapping and things like that, it's like, it, it, it's, it's funny to me because it just kind of, wa- it, it washes over me and I don't take credit for it. But, but it's so easy for us, I think, as Christians to start to take credit, you know, for the good things God does through us. It's like, yeah, look at this fruit. Look at this fruit I'm producing. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a fruity branch right here. And, uh, <laughs> but, I mean, honestly, like, it really has nothing to do with us. It's just, it's just how God is working through us, right? And so with that, there, there's a deep, like, reliance and sense that we need to continue to trust in Jesus, right? If, if there's going to be any fruitfulness. And without that abiding and resting, trusting, walking closely with God, then yeah, then we will not produce fruit. And even the fruit that we produce is only because God is positively impacting us, okay? So with that, there are branches that are thrown away, and then they're picked up and thrown into a fire. So hell is often described in the Bible as a fire. You look at any part of the Bible, and Jesus talks about there's a fire, and it burns forever. And uh, as much as I don't like the idea of that, uh, you know, I I don't think anyone feels comfortable with the idea of an eternal hell, but that is the reality because God's holy, you know? And so with that, Jesus is saying there are going to be branches that will be gathered. And obviously, it's not particularly fun for Jesus to amputate branches for himself. He, he really doesn't, not, he doesn't want to amputate any branches, right? But because of judgment, he's going to amputate some branches, and it's going to hurt God because God desires all to be saved. But there are people he's gonna, going to cast out. And there's a place near my home in the backyard and there are all these branches that fall down because the, there are these giant trees. And so I, I take like one of my boys or whatever, and we have our red wagon, and we just walk around the grass, and we pick up all these uh, sticks. And because we're cheap and um, I don't want to buy firewood, we have a bunch of firewood from all these sticks, right? So in the same way, Jesus is saying that, you know, these sticks are going to be gathered, and they're going to be used in a fire, all right? But as Christians, we don't need to worry about that because as Christians, we've trusted that Jesus has taken on our fire for us. He's taken on the wrath of God, hell for us. So instead, we just need to remain in him. It says, remain in me. My words remain in you. Ask whatever you wish will be done to you. So there's reassurance Jesus is giving his disciples. He's saying, hey, just just keep walking with me. Keep trusting me. You're already clean. You're already going to stay with me. I'm with you. And so I I, I just encourage you to continue to walk in my words. 
he reassures them, hey, ask whatever you, um, you want in my name, as long as it's according to my will, then it'll be done for you. And this is to God's glory, because God gets credit from our fruit bearing, right? Um, God gets all the, all the praise, all the adoration that comes from our lives, because we know apart from him, there would be no results anyway, right? So with that, you know, God gets all the glory, and therefore the sad reality is if there is no fruit, that means there's no discipleship. If there's no fruit in our lives, well, that means then we're not really attached to the vine. You know, it means like we're kind of there, or we might have a profession of faith in Jesus, but, but if, if we're not actually trusting in him and our life is, is not different, um, then, then that shows that we haven't really abided in him, right? So I'll give you an example. I, I was driving this week. This was, I don't know what day it was, but I was, some, I, I've been alternating lately. I, I, I have this like card. Actually, I, well, I'm not going to show you, but I have this card. It's like a, a laminated thing Lauren made for me. But one side says Uber, one side says Lyft. So I, I kind of just let both apps run. Whoever gives me the first one, then I'll, I'll, I'll do that. And so, so I, I drive for both and I alternate depending. <laughs> it's like, I'm driving for Lyft now and I'm driving for Uber. So I, I just alternate whatever gives me a ride. So I drove this, this lady for Lyft. She hops in the car and she's like, yeah, you know, I'm really into healing and crystals. I was like, oh my gosh, I don't want to deal with this. And so, <laughs> um, but anyway, she, she was, she mentioned something like, yeah, I used to go to Calvary Chapel, you know, when Chuck Smith was preaching and things like that. And I was like, oh, this is kind of fascinating. Like, so you're into healing and crystals, but you used to go to Calvary Chapel. And she's like, yeah, you know, I just kind of realized like, you know, I, I got back to my Native American roots and I'm really into like spiritualism and all this stuff. And yeah. And, um, and then she started getting a little invasive with her questions with me. And she's like, there's been a tremendous loss in your family, hasn't there? And I'm thinking to myself, not particularly, like, um, at least comparatively with other people. No, certainly, I wouldn't say that. And so I said, I'm, I, I, don't, I don't really resonate with, with that statement. And she's like, oh, well, yeah, I just sense some kind of blockage from you. I feel like, like you just don't believe, and maybe that's why, like, this doesn't resonate with you. I was like, no, like, literally, there hasn't really been this kind of loss that you're describing. <laughs> and, but I think in her mind, she's like, oh, well, I'm right, you know, because this demon... She, she was totally demonized, you know, but like this demon was telling her like, oh, you know, this guy has like this horrible loss in his life. Oh, he's not listening to you because, um, you know, because he doesn't believe in this stuff. I, I believe in healing, but just not healing from demons because I, I think it's a counterfeit, you know. And so, um, but it was just such a weird car ride. I was like, God, get me out of here. Like, I was like looking at the thing, like, when, when, do, when do I get to drop her off? Because this is <laughs> getting so uncomfortable. Um, but yeah, it was just such a weird question she asked. And Part of me, like, didn't even want to answer it because I was like, I don't even want, like, the potential for any kind of opening towards the spiritual realm. So I almost don't want to answer her, you know. But I just said, honestly, it just doesn't resonate with what, what, you know, with me. So needless to say, there are people who might go to Calvary Chapel and were there when Chuck Smith was around and God did an amazing thing. But it just goes to show that even though she attended the church, well, if she's into, like, healing and demons and crystals and stuff, well, I don't think she's with Jesus. You know, she said like, oh yeah, I'm open to, you know, she seemed like she kind of, she was like open to Jesus in a sense, but she, she really essentially said like, I'm, I'm not into Christianity anymore, you know. So with that, you know, th- there might be people who go to church. They were, they were there when, when the Jesus movement happened and, and things like that. But ultimately the question is, is she trusting alone in Jesus, and just based on her healing questions and crystal stuff, well, it didn't seem like she was trusting alone in Jesus, right? So with that, you know, Jesus is calling us to stick close with him, to be connected with him, to continue to uh, profess faith in him, bear fruit in keeping with repentance, and turning from weird spiritual stuff like that, all right? So let's move on to verse 9, actually. So verse 9 As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. 
I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command, love each other. Okay, just pause at the verse 9. I, want, I, I, I don't know if this hit you. This hit me pretty big this week. But if you look at verse 9, it says, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Wow. That really hit me hard because it's like, the way Jesus loved us by dying for us on the cross, that is the same infinite amount of love of which God the Father himself has for his only son. Like, Jesus is saying they are equivalent in the magnitude of love. And you think about, well, how, how much does the Father love his own son? I mean, infinite. <laughs> an infinite amount of love. So in other words, Jesus has loved us with an infinite amount of love. And with that, when, when that really changes us, then that will affect the way we love other people. Uh, you cannot say, oh, I, yeah, I've, I, 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 I love Jesus, and then we don't love other people. Like, that, that doesn't compute. So Jesus is saying, because I have loved you with the same amount of love that the Father has personally loved me with, love one another. Because that kind of love will change you. It will change you. It'll make you more generous. It'll make you more sacrificial. It'll make you less selfish. It'll make you look for opportunities to serve other people. And that's the love that God is encouraging our church and his church at large to do, is to love like that. And I love, too, how he says, you know, this distinction between servants and friends. He says, I no longer call you servants because a servant doesn't know what his master's business is, but I called you friends. And it, it, Maybe a better way of translating that word friends is uh, dearly loved ones. So he's calling us those who have been dearly loved because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. I mean, obviously, we're still servants. We're still, in a sense, uh, you know, uh, a servant or a slave or a bond servant to Christ because of him purchasing our salvation. He is our master and Lord. But, but I love how Jesus also emphasizes the primacy of the fact that we are dearly loved friends and points out that there is no greater love than this, that he laid down his life for us. So Jesus has loved us to the greatest extent that one could possibly be loved. And because that is the case, and the only case in which someone has loved us to that extent, that's why our joy can be made complete. So Jesus' emphasis is that joy is incomplete without him. So in other words, if people are looking for joy in all the wrong places, right? Looking for an entertainment, overindulging in whatever it might be, um, but the, it's, it's not going to last. It will not give them the, the deepest, richest satisfaction that their soul is looking for. And Jesus is saying that his joy is ours now. It's a foreign joy now made complete in Jesus. So, so Christ wants us to bear fruit by loving others. And I love how, too, that we are chosen. We are, reassured, we are reassured of requests. We're exhorted to love. I want you to take a look at Romans 11 as we get towards the uh, latter part of the message. Romans 11, just a little bit after. John, Acts, Romans 11. Romans 11, 17. Okay. So, because... You know, again, the metaphor has to primarily deal with Israel. So the other question is like, well, what about us? We're Gentiles. We're not Jewish. Is anyone Jewish in here? Yeah, I'm not Jewish. But uh, most of us are Gentiles, if not all of us are Gentiles in here. So the question is, well, what about all the other branches? And so this is what happens. So in verse 17, if some of the branches have been broken off, and you, though a wild olive shoot, so he's saying, hey, there are going to be some, some Jewish people who rejected Jesus as Messiah. They've been broken off. And you, you're a Gentile, wild olive shoot, have been grafted in among the others and now share in the nourishing sap from the olive root. Do not consider yourself to be superior to those other branches. If you do, consider this. You do not support the root, but the root supports you. So what actually happens is you can cut off branches from other plants and stick them onto other plants. It's really cool. It's called grafting. So in other words, God is saying Jesus is a plant, metaphorically speaking, and there were branches broken off. But guess what? God's heart is for Gentiles and not just Jewish people. So God is going to graft in Gentiles from other plants, other nations. And he's going to take these 
branches from up these other plants. He's going to stick them on this Jesus plant, whatever you want to call it. So that's so cool because you know as a Gentile that God was not obligated to reveal himself to you. Actually, he was not really even obligated to reveal himself to Israel, but God had mercy. Um, it's already merciful enough for God to reveal himself to one people group, which is over and beyond what anyone would deserve. But what's even more beautiful is that he also affords us as Gentiles the opportunity to be grafted in, even though we don't deserve to be in because we're not genetically, ethnically Jewish. So that's what's so amazing is like, wow, that is so cool that God had mercy on me to take me from these other nations and he grafted me into Jesus. I was on a plant and I was, I was taken from that plant and I was stuck on with his own hands and I hope that you can rejoice in that fact that God personally grafted you into Christ by faith. So, so with that, we have been grafted into Christ. Others have been removed because of their lack of faith. And with that, let's go back to John 15, and we'll go to verse 18. So with that, he's going to give, con that, that gives context to the world, and the world is going to mistreat his disciples, okay? So verse 18, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Remember what I told you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours also. They will treat you this way because of my name, for they do not know the one who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father as well. If I had not done among them the works no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. As it is, they have seen, and yet they have hated both me and my father. But this is to fulfill what is written in their law. They hated me without reason. So Jesus is going to say, well, there is love within this vine because you have been loved by me. Therefore, you're going to love each other. There's going to be a lot of love, hopefully, within this vine as God built his church. However, the other nations who have not been grafted into Christ, or the people of those other nations that haven't been grafted into Christ, they are going to hate you. They are going to come against you, and they will treat you very poorly. And so Jesus is saying, a servant is not greater than his master, meaning, well, Jesus was very mistreated, and he was the perfect person, right? So him being perfect, well, that seems a little odd that the most perfect person would have the most egregious thing done to them, the most horrific injustice and mistreatment of a, of a perfect person. So with that, Jesus is saying, you have to expect that the world will also come against you. Now, in our country, we have been heavily influenced by Judeo-Christian ethics and Christianity as a whole. So therefore, um, I wouldn't say our nation is Christendom, like, you know, America is like completely, you know, God's uh, territory because we know there's a lot of evil that happens here, right? And not everyone's Christian in America. Um, and with that, I think God has still used our nation in so many positive ways for the gospel. But I will say this, that it has been in some sense beneficial to identify as a Christian, because if you look at previous politicians, you'll notice a lot of them say, oh yeah, I was this denomination, I'm this kind of Christian, and things like that. But I think over time, uh, unless God continues to stir in people's hearts and bring them to him, uh, it just seems like there's more of a trend toward away from Jesus, right? So, so with that, we need to continue to trust that God is at work, but at the same time, recognizing that in so many ways, our, we have benefited from the Christian origins of our nation. Yeah. Uh, actually, the Truth Project that we've been talking about, one of, the, one of the latest videos talks about the state and how, in order to be an official in some of these states, according to their constitution or regulations, you had to profess that you believed in God the Trinity, that you believed in Jesus as the only son who saved us from our sins, you believe the Bible is God's word. And you have to agree to that in order to, you know, to be a government official. 
which you, we're far from that, unfortunately. Yeah. And we're going, you know, Thanksgiving is this week. And during one of the Thanksgivings, my dad, he read this, this speech from Abraham Lincoln. And it's just sad to see, like, what used to be and, like, the gratitude we used to have in God for, for our nation. And with that, you know, um, yeah, there will be some persecution that comes with it. I know when I first became a Christian, especially, and fa- this is when Facebook was still starting up, and people didn't really know how the mechanics worked. But I do remember, like, I posted a note about my faith and just, I didn't really expect anyone to read it, but I just posted it. And there were some people that I went to school with, and I saw on someone else's wall, because that's usually where some people would have conversations. But I remember one of them was like, yeah, what happened to David? I really used to like him, and now he's really into this Jesus stuff, and I don't like it anymore. And then, and then the person responded, yeah, like, it's all a bunch of BS and things like that. And I was like, oh, okay, that's, that kind of hurts a little bit. And then, um, yeah, someone's mom was really angry that I posted the note, but I didn't, like, send it to anyone. It wasn't like I sent it to her son or, like, I was like, hey, you know, you need to read this. It, it would just, I just posted, but it was interesting, like, how much hate I got from that note that I just posted on my own thing. I didn't send it to anyone. I was like, whoa, okay, this is, this is uh, persecution a little bit, right? I mean, I've never been punched in the face for the gospel or, you know, um, things like that. But, yeah, in other, other countries where they're not as polite, perhaps, um, yeah, you could lose your head. You know, we knew of a family who, you know, they were missionaries in Saudi Arabia, and that's what happens there, you know. So, so we happen to have the blessing of the nation that, that we're in, and in a lot of respects, but there is persecution, uh, e- even a little bit. You, as a Christian, you will experience at least to some degree people coming against you, whether it's just words they say or actions that are done or being ostracized, there will be something, right? So what's really crazy about this latter part of the passage is how Jesus also talks about how if they do not receive Christ, they actually hate God which is really interesting because you don't necessarily think about that concept that, wow, if, if I'm rejecting Jesus, that means I actually hate God. Because there are a lot of people who say they love God. They'll do a lot of things for God, right? They'll go on these, you know, pilgrimages. They'll, they'll do these fasts. They'll do all kinds of different ritualistic things, but they don't really love God. And that's what is so mind-blowing is Jesus is saying, if people are rejecting me, that means they hate God, right? And that is the sober reality. And therefore, people are still guilty of sin, but God's heart is constantly for his people. Whenever you look at the Bible, you just see his people and us that we disregard or hate God without reason. And still God is trying to draw us back and loves us. They witness the works of Jesus and yet reject him. I remember I was in class one time and this girl said, well, if I just saw Jesus do his miracles, I would believe, right? But the reality is, yeah, <laughs> shaking your head. The reality is, if you reject Jesus as he is right now, well then, it means you wouldn't receive, yeah, back then. Because I think a lot of people, they say, well, I just need God to answer this prayer, or do this miracle. But the reality is, it, as it stands, if people are rejecting Jesus at this moment, it means that they would not even receive because of the deeds done by him. So with that, I'm going to finish off the passage because it says, verse 26, The Advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father. He will testify about me. And you, also, and you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. So the benefit of walking with Christ and abiding in him is the Holy Spirit resides in us. He indwells us as believers. We can't lose him. Um, you know, we can grieve him, but, but he is our sealed, guaranteed deposit of security and our assurance of our relationship with Christ. And with that, even though the world's going to hate us and come against us, and we're going to have trouble in this world, and maybe not a whole lot of persecution, but you're going to have different sufferings of a variety of different kinds. You know, whether it's your health or financially or job-wise, it doesn't matter. You're going to have some kind of suffering. So even when that comes, you know, the, the spirit of truth, notice the spirit of truth, he, he, he's going to give us truth. He's going to testify to us who Jesus is. And he testifies to us who Jesus is, and because of that transformation that God does in us to abide in Christ, well now, we, by the Holy Spirit, are going to testify to a broken, lost world about who Jesus is.
So we are now witnesses of what God has done. And the the greatest assurance to continue to remain in Jesus is not out of fear of judgment, not out of fear of hell, but it's just the fact that he laid down his life for you. When you think about what it costs for Jesus to lay his life down for us, what essentially he's saying is he was cut off. Jesus is saying, I was cut off as a branch for you and was burned alive in the wrath of God so that you would not be a cut off branch. So when Jesus does that for us, he is taking our place as we deserve. We deserve to be cut off because of our sin. But in Jesus' love for us and God's infinite love for his son, he still sends his own son for us to die in our place, and he becomes that cut-off branch, disregarded, the father turns his face away, and he is incinerated in the wrath of God. He takes on our wrath that we deserve. And because of that, Now, Jesus has made us abide in him. Now we can remain in Christ. Let me have you turn to Psalm 80, and we'll wrap things up. Psalm 80. Verse 8. Actually, you know what? Let's skip down. Let's go Psalm 80, verse 17. Psalm 80, verse 17. Let your hand rest on the man at your right hand, the son of man you have raised up for yourself. Then we will not turn away from you, Revive us, and we will call on your name. Restore us, Lord Almighty. Make your face shine on us, that we might be saved. So, this is referring to a vine, because in verse 8 it says, you transplanted a vine from Egypt. In verse 16, your vine is cut down. We are a vine that deserved to be cut down. But at the same time, Jesus, who is the Son of Man, was raised up on a cross for us, and because of his love, now we will not turn away from him. We will continue to abide because of what he did for us. And he has revived us. He has brought us from death to life. He has made his face and his favor shine on us. And now we're saved and restored. And praise God. So with that, I know some of you maybe have been wrestling in your faith with God. Maybe you haven't had all the answers figured out. But I just want to assure you that God knows Um, And with that, I just encourage you to continue to rest in him and trust him. I know it's hard. I know that there are seasons where the heat is hot or it's cold or, you know, miserable. But I believe that in Christ we have the sustaining power of love that will keep us in him. So let's continue to do that.